Okay, hello everybody and welcome. This is Marilyn Scholl and I'm facilitating tonight's conversation on governing in a recession. We're pleased to have with us tonight Walden Swanson and Mark Goring, my colleagues at CDS Consulting Co-op. And we also have uh, guest Martha Whitman, who is the board president at La Montanita Co-op in Albuquerque, and Peg Nolan, the development director of the NCGA Eastern Corridor. Uh, Michelle Adams is not going to be able to join us this evening. Uh, this is the first in the 2009 series of SeaBuild webinars, and we're very pleased to have all of you with us tonight. So before we move along, I um, just want to let you hear other voices. Um, would you say hello, Walden? Mm, hello, Walden. <laughs> Thank you. Mark? Hello, Walden. <laughs> And Martha. Hello, it's Martha. And Peg. Hello, Peg. <laughs> Hello, this is Peg, not on mute. Oh, good. I was wondering if you had your mute button on. Well, welcome, all of you, and thanks very much. Let's um, move along here and look at the outline that we have for tonight's session. Uh, we're going to start uh, with the introduction and then move quickly into the overview. And all we're trying to accomplish here is just to look at what impact the economy is having on our businesses. Then the second part will be on a cooperative response, uh, how co-op managers need to respond and what opportunities exist now. And then the closing session will be the, the bulk of the evening's topic, and that is governance. What should co-op boards do? And we'll come back with a quick summary at the end. Here's our learning objectives for the evening. An increased understanding of the econ how this economic climate impacts co-op businesses. Uh, looking at how opportunities might open up for co-ops in this cycle having a framework for boards, having that framework for thinking about the changing economy and knowing what kinds of changes boards might want to expect in management reporting and interpretation. First section, then, uh, what impact is the economy having on our business? And these slides are taken from a presentation that Scott Van Winkle made to the NCGA general managers in January. I want to uh, thank Scott for allowing us to use these slides in tonight's presentation. First is just looking at the trends in growth in the United States for natural and organic food sales from 1997 and then uh, uh, through 07 and then projected into the future. And that forecasted growth, according to, to Scott at uh, Canaccord Adams, is now in question pretty steep growth curve t up until then. Uh, this, the growth curve translates into um, between a 10 and 12 percent, moving up to a 13.9 there in 2006 for natural and organic food um, in all channels. This is the, the blended growth was um, uh, very close to that in, in both the mass and the core natural channels. And food co-ops uh, mirrored this growth in a, in over these, the same period of time, uh, growing in the range of 8 to 11 or 12 percent during the same time period. This is before the recession. This is a, just a look at different categories. The um, particular categories aren't of particular importance, but just looking at the growth, what growth looked like yesterday compared to today. Just give you that visual one more time. <laughs> what growth was like before and what it's like now. This is Whole Foods Market. The blue line shows their comparable store sales, showing that comparable stores were, were growing along in 2007 at uh, 6 to 7 percent and then took a very steep dive in the first quarter. The, um, the pink line is their gross margin. For this purpose today, we're looking primarily at sales. 
looking at sales uh, trends in, in some supermarkets um, with uh, Kroger still moving along uh, at a at a five percent with a, a little bit of a increase here in the second quarter of 08 while the other markets uh, this green line is Harris Teeter the uh, blue line Safeway and the orange line uh, super value with the others showing quite a bit of decline through the fourth quarter of 07 and the beginning of 08 with a, a little bit of um, starting to rebound. The conclusion that Scott made on 2008 uh, was a story of three consumers, that the, the mass market transitional customer was lost early. And that was, was evidence in some of them moving over back over to the mass market, that the, the transitional customers, the ones that came to, the, to food co-ops uh, for a few products that were just beginning to think about uh, changing their diet, their lifestyle, their purchasing, um, that those were, were lost early and may be the longest before they would return. The premium customer, those looking for the highest quality, lasted a little bit longer, about six months into the recession, but eventually uh, they, they grew fatigued and also started to fade away. Uh, restaurant sales weakened as far back as 2007, and the premium food retailers followed that about six months later. But the core natural organic consumer conserved in other areas until October. The shock and awe, as Scott says, of October uh, simply became overwhelming. And that's when um, it began to uh, show up in, uh, for the core consumers. And that's also when it began to show up primarily for food co-ops. This slide looks at a, a couple of um, uh, previous time periods. The uh, starting with uh, 2000, May of 2000 on a quarterly basis. And the blue line is natural and organic. Uh, so during the, the last recession in the fall of um, 2001, that we actually had some increases. And the trends were pretty good, while other sectors of the economy were going down. Uh, this is thought to be a, re uh, a reaction to the nesting instinct that during the recession people, the, the 2001 recession, people were interested in being at home more, cooking more, cherishing things that um, natural or organic food could offer. But the sense is that this recession could be quite different. This map shows um, the geography of the recession, uh, job losses, uh, with the darker areas showing the highest job losses, the expectation that the economies in those regions uh, will be much harder hit. And so co-ops in those regions would have, uh, w would have more to pay attention to than co-ops in the regions where job loss is not uh, quite as extreme. This chart looks at the growth rate just for food co-ops and just in the last four months. So this is starting, the blue bar is starting in November the green one in December, January, and February. So the last four months. And this uh, shows that during that time period, the, the majority of co-ops, uh, uh, nearly the, the majority of the co-ops responding, the highest bars in this, sorry, 35% uh, were growing in the 0 to 5% range, with a few uh, growing higher than that, um, 6 to 10. Uh, some 11 to 15, and some at still more than 15 percent. Um, many of these are ones that had just completed expansion projects and were experiencing the, the natural sales growth from bigger stores and um, more products available. But a significant number of co-ops were starting uh, to experience negative sales growth or declining sales, and uh, a, f a few here even as much as uh, 10 percent. Well, then I wonder if you would want to, you've gathered this data and have been looking at it carefully. I wonder if you would want to comment on, on what you think is important about this. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> it's interesting. What, what the most interesting part about me, 
to me about this is that the growth has slowed from that 8 to 11 percent that you had mentioned for the last few years to this, you know, the 0 to 5 or 6 to 10 or minus 1 to 5. And that looks pretty, pretty bad compared to the four years. But I also took the uh, Whole Foods figures and adjusted for inflation. And the co-ops are doing for the same stores with Coppos out there on the left that you pointed out without the expansion, it's just the identical stores were about 10% uh, higher spread than, than Whole Foods uh, after inflation. So that, that would mean if, um, if our growth rate was, say, 1% right there for a comparable store right there in the middle, that the Whole Foods would be a minus 10% for comparable stores after inflation. So it's quite quite significant. We're, we're doing well compared to our, one of our major competitors, but we're doing worse, absolutely, than we were last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting data, actually. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thanks. So the, the primary point we wanted to make with this sec session, section of the session tonight is that the, the recession is having an impact on our businesses. Um, it's not a seminar on the economy, so we're not going to spend any more time than, than that on it. I'll just um, continue to, to move through uh, how managers might need to respond. And uh, Walden, I'll let you take it from here. Sure. And then um, many of you have read the articles that um, were referenced in this particular webinar. The one from Harvard Business Review. Uh, the, there's a New York Times article that was um, sent out and an article by Pat Cumby. Any, any of you? You just raise your hands. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Uh, any comments on any of those articles, especially this uh, this one on the on the Harvard Business Review? Mark, you can unmute them, right? If people want to make comments. Yeah, Marilyn, do you want to do that, or do you want me to? Or they can also send in comments via the um, question okay. and answer toolbar. Well. Let's let's go this slide first. Then it, the the Harvard Business Review article, and this uh, this came out just a couple of months ago, and it was trying to address how companies should position themselves during this downturn or in the or in a recession. And the neat part about that article was that it was how to seize the advantage during a downturn. So it wasn't just running; it was positioning. And there were two basic themes to that article. And one was uh, it was suggesting that managers and boards take a really rapid assessment of where they were at the time, at, at right now, and then take some decisive action to, to protect their, their assets and to accumulate liquidity. And then to start looking around the second part for opportunities to take advantage of, uh, of what was going on in the, in the whole industry. But basically, the idea is, how can you be a survivor and accumulate some resources and then have more and more co-ops survive and thrive when the recession starts ending and the economic activity starts ticking up again? That's the basic theme of that article. And there were lots of <clears throat> fundamental kind of tactical things they would do. I, I remember one of them that was so interesting. It said, if you have a line of credit with a bank and you don't have it uh, drawn because you don't want to pay interest on it, draw it anyway. Get the cash because you don't know what's going to happen to that bank and you don't know what's going to happen to the economy and you might not be able to pull it later. So even if it costs you a little bit more interest, accumulate that cash and put it in a savings account and uh, just pay the difference in what you earn and what you're paying in interest. That those kind of things were, were sprinkled throughout that particular article. And um, a lot of it was about protecting your existing business and 
you know, getting back to the core part and paying attention to those core customers and, you know, what you would kind of think. But another one was saying in their research, if a company cut their marketing expenses too much, that might do more harm than good. So one of their other suggestions was aggressively manage the top line. And so it was a, uh, you know, trying to get people in and, and uh, paying attention to the core customer and then doing things like, like flyers and less brand advertising and more uh, immediate kind of short-term marketing and, and uh, advertising dollars to get people in. Um, and then the, well, I the second one part that was really interesting in, uh, in the presentation that, that you made at the work session in New Orleans with, with uh, the NCGA managers was um, how ready the, the managers were to, to start working on developing plans. Like after Scott's presentation and yours, uh, we had a, a, the room full of managers working together on, on developing their sets of plans and strategies for each of their the co-ops in the local area. And it, it seemed like quite a, um, a reassuring response to me that the, the managers were really uh, looking carefully, understood the situation, and were, were developing plans to respond. Is that your statement? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It was quite a fun meeting there in a, in a dark economic situation. That was, uh, I was, I was uh, impressed with how, how the managers responded. Yeah. Okay. Or Peg, you might have any, you have any comments on that since you were, you kind of organized all that too. You did a great job, okay. Walden. <laughs> and then talk a little bit about what some of the opportunities are, Walden, and why you think that yes. there's, there are opportunities for co-ops now. Maybe you could start by just giving us a little bit of an overview of uh, Hirschman's theory. Sure. Uh, and I really encourage you to read that New York Times article that was included in the packet and Pat Cumby's article uh, that addressed this particular issue. But, you know, one thing that kind of intrigued me is why there were over a hundred communities trying to organize food co-ops now in the last couple of years. And you just kind of scratch your head. Uh, Ten years ago, when Walmart wasn't selling natural and organic food, there were hardly any communities organizing new co-ops. So now that everybody has some natural and organic, what's going on? How come now there's more organizing around co-ops, and um, it, it led me again to a, a book I'd read earlier, this Shifting Involvements by Hirschman, and his theory is that it there's a cycle that goes on, it, and I call it the we and me cycle, and um, it, it, it's the cycle that, that kind of a where people are focused more on accumulating wealth and individualism, and then it cycles back to where people, you know, are, are working for the common good and getting benefit or psychic benefit from from doing that, and that cycle goes in and out. So in the 70s, when probably many of you started co-ops, that was probably the height of one of those we cycles, and characterized by the you know, the Vietnam War protests and the women's movement and civil rights and environmental movement, all of those kind of we kind of um, sociological kind of phenomena started during that, that same period. And then, of course, in, in the 80s and 90s, that was where Garden Gecko was, uh, was certainly an icon and, and Enron was too. And that was probably pretty descriptive of the of the me generation or the me cycle, and uh, and maybe some of AIG uh, in in the current day, and you can see the reaction against that those bonuses now in the Obama phenomena and the number of people that grassroots people that were involved in that particular campaign indicate that there probably is an upswing in the we cycle. And to me, that's the most exciting thing for us because there's going to be a natural force for people wanting 
to be involved in co-ops and we can be more straightforward with our message if Hirschman's theory is true and um, there will be people forming co-ops whether we want them to or not. So if we can harness that that ni natural energy, uh, I think there's we could get a significant boost to our, our movement. Hey, Mark, is it easy to put up that little graph that you and I've worked on that, that oh, yeah. shows some of those yeah, cycles? It is that actually easy. Thing. Hold on one sec. Marilyn, I'm going to just grab the uh, presentation thing okay. here back from you for a second. And uh, <laughs> that's horrible. I can't believe that picture's in there. Right. So is that up there now? Real, yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah. And this just shows uh, the old wave co-ops that started in the 30s, as Mark is pointing out there, in, in, the, in the pink. And then how they, you know, for, for a couple of decades, they really grew in number and in volume. And then, over time, you can see that sliding down, both in volume and in number. And then in the 60s and 70s, the green are the co-ops that we're involved with now. And how those just, I mean, gosh, almost 700 by some accounts started in just a decade. And then a lot of those uh, went out of business, but a lot of those merged into each other, like La Montanita, and, um, and the volume continued to grow. And it's a pretty good indication, at least from the co-op point of view, of that same cycle that Hirschman talked about. It, our movement does mirror his theory. The same thing can be uh, said of the co-ops in the UK, and they are definitely on a resurgence um, now. And probably another data point that kind of underlies that Hirschman theory, as Pat said in that article, is like a, a million new members in just a couple of years with their new branding campaign and, and, and being just uh, so straightforward about their message of a, of a co-op and, and working on the, for the common good. So I think that's the big thing that I wanted to uh, open up for comments and questions and discussions is whether other people see that, how we could take advantage of that, and, uh, and actually have a discussion about that phenomena. Um, Peg, I wonder if you might be uh, willing to start off the, the conversation and, and uh, speak to what you see as opportunities for food co-ops if Walden and Her Hirschman's theories are correct that there are opportunities for us here. How do you see that? Hey, Marilyn, I'm going to give you back the ball here. Okay. So, uh, thanks, Marilyn. So, what we have noticed in our co-ops and in the areas around them is this phenomenon that Walden was referring to earlier, which is that there's a lot of co-ops that are trying to start up. And so what, it's, what it seems to exemplify and where our co-ops that exist already have been able to do is to try and provide kind of leadership within their community for understanding what the co-op is uh, doing or how a co-op is a good response in an economic crisis. And so, uh, you know, for our, our boards of directors, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nail biting opportunity in some ways because none of us knows what's going on, but to really find ways to communicate more clearly with the constituents that you have and to try and encourage a conversation that would strengthen uh, both people's understanding of what a co-op is and how co-ops are an answer to uh, economic uh, hardships that can be characterized in so many ways today. There's so many things to say we're not like that or that or that. Um, and then to really uh, build a conversation with the community and support the general manager as they really try and find ways to make all of the numbers hold together. So. The board has the opportunity to provide leadership at a time when people are are just starting to get edgy and feel fearful, and to, to, to help understand what, how a co-op provides us with an opportunity to be inter interdependent in a way we always have been, but suddenly are more aware of. So as people are desiring to be more independent, here here's the co-op that has always given them that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. You know, First Martha had some here. good good points about that about this issue also. Before the well, one thing I'd like to say is that it, it, it's clear that people want more co-ops, and we have quite a few towns that are always asking us to come in and, and start a co-op. And I think uh, what has shifted and we're, we're able to take advantage of, and it really came clear when we had Gar Alperovitz come to our annual meeting, and he was telling people, don't go looking to ask, again, sort of the Obama message, what your co-op can do, what is it you can do, and what are you going to, willing to do for the next 20 years? And it really showed up in a couple of years ago, we had a World Cafe, and we had members come, and they told us, well, we want a victory garden. And I mean, they had programs up the yin-yang, and we said, great, thank you for that information. And then we had a World Cafe following Gar's speech, and it was, they started organizing. I don't think we can be missionaries and just come in and plant our co-ops and expect things to take root, that we have to really get people to identify with their co-op and that it's theirs, and because there is this pull to um, have us take care of it. And our resources are limited. I mean, so our board's just always looking at our priorities with the resources. And offering help, uh, we do that on a board level and on a management level. We're more than happy to share the information. I thought your point about technology was worth uh, making, right. too. Yeah, I think that um, what I've been noticing in reading history and noticing as I try to network more with co-ops of how isolated boards get. I think NCGA has addressed really well a way for managers to be connected, but it's a lot harder on a board level. We're volunteers with a high turnover, and we don't we feel very isolated. and. I think that is starting to shift. There's various programs, CDS being one, and of, of getting us more connected that allows us to learn more from our mistakes or to be inspired by what people are accomplishing. I mean, there's the, the great stories as well as the hard stories. And I think that gives us a little edge over the cycles that were in the past. That's my hope, say, as Berkeley or Greenbelt and what they had to go through. Just while we're having the conversation, I've put the article up that uh, Pat Company wrote with an interview with Walden and just highlighted some sections of that um, just uh, to give us uh, something kind of to, to focus on. Um, Mark, I wonder if, if at this point you might want to jump into this conversation about the cycles of me and we and what got you yeah. excited about that. Yeah, thanks, Mel. And, and um, I'm not sure if, if you have... Um, a couple of the quotes there that I was particularly drawn to um, regarding the board's work, but the um, the idea that um, a we might be in a golden age, you know, for cooperative development, and then uh, Walden, you 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 have a quote in there, and it's and it's related. You're, you're kind of keying off of the of the food club 500 and the startup thing, but you're 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 raising the question of gee, there's something bigger than us going on, <laughs> right? And so how do we take a formal and systematic advantage of the opportunity? And, you know, to, to me, what's really um, a, a challenge and it's kind of the inspiration is how do we look up and out um, to see what's, what is bigger than us, right? I mean, yeah. how, how do we actually, you know, grapple with uh, the bigger trends and uh, the things that are, that are, you know, maybe uh, less known to us, and that that might be, you know, way bigger, for example, than our um, term on the board. You know, if I'm if I'm my term is up or I'm up for election, you know, in six months, and we're actually. You know, grappling with something that's you know part of a of a real profound you know like Martha was saying twenty year uh, commitment, <laughs> right? It's like uh, it, it's harder to, it's harder to um, to organize for, you know, and stay on track. And yet, what 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 you're saying in the article really is that you know that is the opportunity to get up there. Uh, and then the other thing that, that I really like that you do in the article, Walden, is, is this thing that the, um, a window of opportunity is not a permanent situation. 
So to me, that says, "Hey, let's go ahead and raise the bar, and you know, and go for it, whatever it looks like, because you know, now is the time, and it might not last forever." Right. Right. Uh, just along those lines, that that was that was good. Um, but to me, the how this ties back into that Harvard Business Review article in that session in New Orleans that Marilyn referred to is it it it's like a perfect storm for us in the good uh -huh. sense because it, it seems like to me that we have this recession if we do the kind of things that the Harvard Business Review recommends like getting back to our core basics which is our cooperative nature and and hoarding that cash and stockpiling that cash and surviving and then you know we've we've um, formed NCGA at the right time because our it, we were able to preserve our margins we've got lots of support from from the development directors and assistant development directors to improve our operations and you know and we as Marilyn said in New Orleans, the managers really just took it on. So it seems like part of the perfect storm is just doing the right things, and it looks like we've done them and are doing them, and that we'll be a big survivor in this economic downturn. And then the upside is the second part of the Harvard Business Review, and it coincides with that Hirschman cycle. So it, if you can imagine the opportunity area when the economy starts taking back off and we've got that accumulated resources. Martha, you had mentioned that accumulated resources also. And then, you know, we have that, that uh, those sociological uh, imperatives that are going on in our favor. Plus, we'll be coming out of recession stronger than probably our competition. And putting that all together, I think, is just a you know, a unique opportunity in our lifetime. We might not know exactly what we're going to be, what that opportunity is going to be, but from a board point of view and a manager's point of view, I think being ready to take it, to seize advantage of those opportunities is the key thing right now. There's a, a uh, one, one last thing. I one last thing. Uh, one last little comment on that. I just love this uh, that that uh, in the New York Times article, there was that one comment about how that, that there always be, even in the we cycle, there are going to be these me advocates, you know, these me diehards. And that quote by Milton Friedman that said, I just don't get that John F. Kennedy <laughs> thing. He said, he said, you know, it doesn't make any sense to ask not what, you, uh, what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I don't get it. I thought that was so interesting to come from a Nobel laureate uh, that he couldn't get that that we cycle that Kennedy probably uh, was identifying in some ways during his inaugural speech. There's a comment coming in from the audience here. I'd like to to bring in and ask uh, some of you to respond to it. Um, in thinking about strategic positioning in this str strategic cycle, it strikes uh, this writer that the Gallup poll. Uh, revealing relative trust in cooperatives might be reinvigorated with this idea of trust, trust in your neighbors, your community, and the co-op sector versus the nebulous ownership of our competitors all wound up in the financial markets. You see an mm -hmm. opportunity there in that um, issue of, of trust and the different ownership structure. Um, Martha, what, what about you? Um, the what that has done for for us is to say we need to relook at our capitalization structure. This is an opportunity where we may have been missing um, opportunities for people to invest in their co-op. We have a fee structure, which is one of the more common ways. Can we do something else or adjunct or so we have send it to committee to explore the options? So I, I think people are going to be much more excited about putting fifty dollars or hundred dollars into their co-op than somewhere with don't know what's going to happen, and I hope that we can figure that out within this cycle of the cycle of we so that it, it works, but that's what it immediately triggered for me. It's funny that you would say that, Martha, because some of the stores that we have currently expanding uh, I know have had a greater interest in member lending and even have been able to collect some loans beyond their goals, which 
startled nice. me on some level, but it's 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 been an, a good response along the lines that you're talking about. Right. We've always funded through our bottom line, and it's and it's been good, and it's worked. But has it been the best? And can we take the opportunity now to ramp it up? Um, Marilyn, if I could jump in on the, on this uh, kind of building on that and connecting it back to what what the way Walden was describing the things that we have been focused on that are adding up to strengthen our position and 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 just to bring in this this trust thing, you know what Brett Fairbairn is writing about in the three three strategic concepts is really the co-op as the as the agent. Right, the trusted agent, and you know, I think that we've been uh, we we take that trust issue very seriously, and again, it kind of goes back up to the to the board position and implementation of of programs um, that really do directly benefit uh, members in their communities, so that people can really see it and feel it. Uh, but you know, that trust agent concept is is really strong, I think, in our co-op. So if that's an emerging kind of a, a larger, you know, societal value, uh, you know, hey, great. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're in alignment on that. <laughs> Good. There's a, another question here from the audience that, that I'd like to bring in. There's a, a lot of them. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Thanks for typing them in. Um, I find that some shareholders have unrealistic expectation of just how much the co-op can do for shareholders, workers, local farmers, and the community while running a business that in the best of times operates on a very tight margin. How do boards educate shareholders about the importance of serving we rather than me, i.e. the benefit of moving from shareholder discounts at the register to the patronage dividend? or the benefit of investing in the creation of a new facility with an eye towards the long term. How do we communicate this uh, to our shareholders and owners? Thoughts on that? Um, Peg, do you have any um, thoughts about that communication strategy or Walden? What a uh, great question. That was a great comment, too. Yeah, Well, then why don't you start off? So the I guess the question is how do we communicate that um, and and get people aligned behind that the the common good kind of uh, question rather than the the me uh, which might be discounts at the register is that that I understand that question correctly? Yeah, how to bring a, a shareholders. And members mm -hmm. uh, involved in an understanding and and getting on the bandwagon, I think, of the cycle of we and understanding that the co-op is that they are part of the we of the co-op. Right. Well, I think that um, part of it is going to happen because of the cycle, and then part of the the first part of the comment that you read, Marilyn, uh, reminded me of that Hirschman article, which basically says that the we cycle kind of starts deteriorating because of the disappointment that people have. It's not as good as we thought over time. And that's probably true. And that whoever made that comment was probably very astute. And um, the the UK I'll see if I can find it in this next section and post it here but they have just a wonderful um, little uh, YouTube piece on trying to get at exactly that why co-op and what's the difference and how it uh, how it becomes the how the we is accentuated and I think that might be one of the most useful little things that uh, that we could share tonight that uh, all of you might be able to take back and, and distribute. It's really quite good. And you've probably seen reference to it because it's Bob Dylan's soundtrack for the first time, Blowing in the Wind. Um, have you seen it? Have many of you seen that? that um, uh, yeah, I have. It's, uh, nice. Yeah, it's very nice. Yes, yeah. Uh, Mark, if you have it right there, could you paste it in for people? Or put, we could put it on the library? 
Uh, yeah, we can definitely put a, a link uh, a link in uh, to the to the library for sure. I'll do that today. And one little comment on that one: the making of that um, that video piece is uh, more interesting than the piece itself. Yeah, um, that would be good to put both of those links in there. Uh, that and people could probably use those in their in their local community for sure. But it addresses just that topic that um, that was raised, I think. And that that's the the UK one one approach that the UK is taking to to deal with that issue. Thanks, Walden. Now, Peg, did you have thoughts on communicating with shareholders on the the cycle of we? Yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting. I was listening to Amy Goodman tonight on Democracy Now in the car and. She had this guy from Rolling Stone who wrote an article about this whole economic mess. But what he kept saying again and again that keeps coming back to me at this moment is, you know, everybody kept handing this back to the very people who caused the problem because they kept saying it was too complicated for people to understand. And looked at what the mess is that we're in now. And I keep coming back, you know, it's like how, how complicated is it to explain you know, what your co-op is? In terms of a local building a local economy, working together, you know, as Sid Kibahushki used to say, it's uh, interdependence properly understood, or something like that. I mean, there's all those little things that say, if we work together, we together are smarter and can figure these things out. And it's true we can't do everything, but we can do what we decide to do. If and so to to try and figure out how to how to use the the trust and the we in terms of you know, in in the context of the Harvard article, how do we how do we build the top line? How do we encourage people to really invest themselves and their money in organizations and uh, businesses that are going to produce more wealth in their community and a better quality of life for all of us? And so, and how do we engage in decision making about that at those times when we can? So. If co-ops are about profit, how are we building profit? And then how are we how are we dispersing it in a way that makes sense to the interests of our membership as a whole as we understand that and as you have told us this is what it is. And so when I think about, you know, governing in a recession and leadership and boards, what I want is, you know, that that message comes through that we believe in us. We are a solution. And we, coming together, can we catalyze ourselves in a meaningful way to build the future that we want? And the board is uniquely qualified and positioned to put together that conversation and to manage it in a way that uh, can really help us, cat, you know, kind of catapult forward through a crisis. What is it? The chief of staff, Obama's chief of staff, says, you know, why waste a crisis? I think that's a great banner. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, that's a you good know? good point. <laughs> yeah. That there sounds like in a lot of ways, Peg, you're saying keep it simple, keep the message uh, very very simple and clear. Mm -hmm. We have been a complicated trying. way to. I was going to say it's a complicated way to say it, wasn't it? <laughs> right. And so, our, for our co-op, what we've been able to do is be very consistent in our newsletter articles of putting out the message, but we'll do various themes. And we ran through one series where a board member would write what got them into the co-op and then how did it even to progress for them to want to be on. So all the values start percolating up so that people could identify themselves in that picture. And I think that's helpful, of, that it's a human organization and that builds the trust. And then we talk about the real cost of money. I mean, there's all that. Uh, information that comes out as well. So we sort of pick different flavors of, of, of mm -hmm. ideas to keep presenting and we're just present every month. One, one thing that I'm kind of interested in somebody doing is um, some new research on, the, on people's perceptions of co-ops. So it was um, Hanover, no, it was a uh, City Market and PCC both did some research at, in the past, and 
maybe people didn't come to the co-op originally because it was a co-op. They came for, for products more than anything else. It would be interesting to see now if, uh, if, the, if current research would replicate those findings or be more like the research that, that the UK has come up with, that, that there is some concept part of a co-op that's intriguing to people and becoming more so now. So that it might be, might be time, if we're careful about it, uh, to be more straightforward with our message about being a co-op. And then it might evolve at some point where, where we get people into the store and then we capture them into the co-op spirit. Uh, but I think that's a, that's, that's a real issue right now that we don't have good data on. It would be interesting to, to get better data on what's going on right now and if it's changed. Yeah, it sure would. Um, thanks, all. Mark, this might be a good time for us to, to switch um, a little bit and, and look a little more more specifically at the, the governance role right now. Um, I, I really appreciate this uh, conversation around the, the It's site. a great segue. Yeah, it's a great segue, really. Um, and what we, um, if you want to just flip that next, that next uh, slide, Marilyn, the um, kind of the bumper sticker um, message is keep governing, exclamation point. <laughs> And this idea of, of talking the walk is really this communication thread that we were just having. You know, how do we share with our members and really the larger community about, you know, what it means to be a co-op? What's it look like? And um, anyway, the, the interesting thing, this slide here is just kind of the overview of, of some of the things that we wanted to touch on. Um, and. The first thing I wanted to say about it is that all the stuff here in governing of the recession, uh, in the recession period, is really the same uh, concept, the same underlying principles that we've been focusing on, on with, um, uh, for the past few years. You have this unique role that Peg is describing that's, that's fundamentally uh, different than management's role. You are in this great position to assume a leadership position and to speak. And now the question is, you know, what are we saying? What's it look like? How does it attract uh, this? You know, attract people in a we cycle. Uh, so it's it's really kind of exciting to me that uh, again, it's an another one of these things like Walden was mentioning that we've kind of laid the groundwork uh, to be here, and now in a way the bar just went up because we can see that, wow, we really should be uh, focused on doing this very well uh, because it matters because there's this moment, right? And maybe the moment is five years long or, or you know, who knows how long it is, but, um, you know, let's not miss it and be, um, you know, focused on, on uh, you know, why is there a sticky price tag on my tomato <laughs> or one of those other topics that could veer the board out of this conversation. Um, so anyway, we had uh, kind of highlighted talking the walk, um, having great group process, and in, in that, um, the intention also is beyond the board. It's almost creating alignment throughout the whole organization, again, like Fairbairn is talking about, um, being reasonable, uh, and there the idea is that is to really be open to change and open to the dynamic activity that might surface. Uh, in both phases that are present in the uh, Harvard Business Review article, the kind of the, the, the tuning and then the seizing the advantage. Um, and, and then, wow, what a great time to be uh, focused on and celebrating a great management. So those are some of the little necessary ingredients that we wanted to a little bit touch on and on, a, on in addition to the Harvard Business Review article and the Hirschman thing. And um, Marilyn, if you Will you just run the slide and great. Um, uh, Martha, I'd like for you to share uh, some of your, uh, what your co-op's been doing specifically on your study and engagement work. Because I think, you know, the topic uh, that you selected out of your last board retreat to really pursue rigorously is, you know, so beautifully connected to this conversation. Sure. What, when you asked, told me that that, 
was something you'd like me to talk about, I had to really step back because it took years to get here. Even yes. before, it took time before I was on the board. And it took tightening up our process that then gave us the freedom not to be concerned about the sticky on the tomato plant, on the tomato, but to think beyond. And then we still had to fumble. So we, we, you know, we got into policy governance, and then we operated for years without ends, and then we created some ends that you know, were needed work, and then we finally worked on them some more. And, and finally, out of that process, we could start realizing what is it that we need to know that we have no idea we need to know. And that's a pretty daunting question. Um, and we kind of ran some series of, of discussion time in our board trying to go, well, maybe we need to learn about the community economics. What do other uh, community organizations do, like churches, to, to work with their members? And that didn't quite work. And so we regrouped. And we came up with a question um, that, that we've committed to for a year. And we, when I I say that it means that we put aside an hour at every board meeting to have a group discussion based on readings that we have um, come prepared with and try to uh, this dialogue on those in the context of our overriding question. And our overriding question is, what would it mean to take the economic model seriously, the cooperative economic model seriously? And it's a great question. And then it's like, well, how do we study that? <laughs> And we have a committee that works on uh, pulling together that question and coming up with readings. And we've decided to start with history. And so we're you know, starting with Rochdale. Now we're into American history. Next month is international history. I had questions about capitalization, so that's going on. We wanted to know what is globalization about versus localization. And we're. We're about three months in on this particular question, and we have not been able to answer that question. It just feels like we have created a base that's made us stronger to, um, to approach it. Uh, so it's a little frustrating uh, that I can't tell you what it will look like. But the idea was after an end of a year, what would be different because we had an answer to that question? Right, and and you know, so here's a co-op of what you're uh, 30 years old or something, Martha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 30-year-old co-op saying, "Wow, what if we took this model seriously? What might that <laughs> what might that do for us? Where where might that take us? Right? Mm -hmm. It's really incredible. I love it. Um, and and I think you know, it's 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 really part of what you know, Gar Alperovitz when he talks about you know how what are your underlying theories and. And, and in my mind, part of what La Martinique is going to create is, is what are those attractions, you know, out of this uh, co-op thing, you know, what, what are those member benefits uh, that, that will attract people, um, you know, during the we cycle? And to just add one more idea around this process of studying and having this group discussion, our board meetings are really interesting now. People want to be there. The dialogue mm -hmm. is... Uh, very thoughtful, uh, people offer differing opinions, and it's just raised the quality of our board meetings. And I think that has kept us able to think more about the vision than the operation of the stores. So there's another side effect to this whole process. And I, I think it makes it look much more attractive to be on our board. So Walden, I'm just curious, what do you think about a co-op really just driving that fundamental question of, you know, what does it mean to be a co-op? Why does it matter? Is that, you think that's uh, that, that the dialogue that could build up out of that would be uh, relevant in, a, in building in the we cycle? Well, it, it certainly sounds like fun uh, listening to Martha's uh, comments. I said, wow, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty neat. Uh, I do think that uh, it's going to be cool to be involved in a co-op and on a co-op board now, and maybe 10 or 15 years ago it was less cool. So I think that actually adds to it, too. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great question. I'd like to, that, that sounds fun to me, and interesting and useful. Great. That was neat to hear Martha's experience there. And the, the other, other idea, uh, go ahead. 
Well, this is something else you asked me to bring out, that we're also archiving these conversations so that mm -hmm. new board members can have them in their orientation so that they can be brought up to speed. This is what we're mm -hmm. about, you know. Uh -huh. and, then the, and then also the idea of telling the story along the way, right? So again, kind of going back to that question that the, um, the, the person wrote in about of like, well, how do you, how do you communicate about uh, the benefit to the whole, right? And I, mm -hmm. again, I think that's you know, one of those fundamental ideas that we have to be able to address the self-interest of the member and the benefit to the whole so that we can talk kind of on both planes all the time. And just you know, I, I think the I think this idea of um, uh, you know you know driving the question of why does our co-op matter and and you know why is it a, why is it a good thing is uh, it's really a great time for that. And you know, kind of going back to the startup, you know, we were we we were talking earlier about the, uh, using startup co-ops as a kind of a symbol of of that that wow, there's something going on. In a way, they have it easier than these 30-year-old co-ops because the startup co-op doesn't have a story yet to be distracting them. Mm -hmm. The startup co-op is all about the mission, right? When they get together, they talk about, wow, what is our desired outcome here? What is it that we're trying to produce the benefit for, for our community? Um, I had the good fortune of, of working uh, with uh, some people in New Orleans who are trying to organize a co-op. and and when when you hear them talk about the vision and the the the, the good that will uh, be produced as a result of people joining together and pooling their capital and you know starting a neighborhood store, it's pretty inspiring. It's pretty good. So I, I think that boards uh, and and really not just boards, really all throughout the organization, you know the the board and the management and all the staff and. And the, and the members, I mean, the more versed that we can be on, on um, talking about stuff that, you know, I like Peg was bringing up, let's, let's, let's boil it down. You know, what are the five things? <laughs> what, you know, let, let's, learn, let's learn from history and let's ask the, 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 the deep strategic conversation and then let's emerge out of that and say, hey, you know what, it's, it's seven things. And they're really incredible. They're worth it. Let's get together and do this thing, or let's build what we have. Right. So I think that's this first this first idea of uh, keep governing. Um, you know, be up and out with uh, talking about communicating on the mission. So let's move on to the next slide, there, Marilyn. This. Is maybe it's a how it's a how issue, or, or it's a fundamental board issue. Of you know, uh, Martha brought up. Uh, we prepared. Uh, it took us a lot of work to get to this place of being able to you know have this time in our board meeting and be kind of strategically positioned to have this conversation. And now is the time, right? Now is the time to say let's really be a great board. Uh, it's worth it. It's going to actually, you're going to see something, see a result. Walden is saying it's cool to be on a board. <laughs> People are going to be attracted to board service. You know, let's not be satisfied with dysfunctional uh, board work. Let's, let's raise the bar, have aspirations. Um, you know, really say that we need to be doing this at a high level right now. And I think to me that is what we've been working towards and, and you know, we're, we're doing it. And now we can say, "Wow, this is a really good time to be to be doing it." And you know, the third point about if you see that that you've got some you know wobbles, something out of balance, I guess you know now is a good time to 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 fix that and really say, you know, it's not okay for us to to not uh, be in alignment and have have good process because uh, we need that if we're going to actually attract uh, if we're going to be a magnet for for this. Uh, this we cycle thing that's happening. Mark, could you maybe say just a, a little bit more about that? Because I think in this economic climate, that a lot of people are stressed out and worried, and and that kind of uh, fear in a, in us as human beings often translates into our relationships with. Yeah. Us. And so, how how do we support and, and nurture our boards to 
to, to recognize the stress. I mean, in a way, I think that's why we started the, the uh, series tonight with, hey, the economy is bad. You yeah. know, let's put that out there. But now let's get go get on with our work. What are we trying right. to accomplish? And, and so taking that idea to kind of interpersonal relationships. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah. I, I, yeah thanks so much, Marilyn, because yeah, it, this is so, so important. And, and what, I'm, what I'm thinking of uh, as you were describing that is let's really have, this is a great time to have role clarity, right? So that, it, you know, we can see that the board has this, has this unique position in the organization. And um, like we have said earlier, that you know, managers have their eyes open. They're they're focused. They have uh, they have practice. We're not you know we're not starting out learning how to run good businesses. We actually have a lot of experience, uh, a lot of peer support, NCGA support, and so now the issue is how do we um, develop the relationships between say the community, the membership, the board, and management so that we can uh, have kind of alignment in the vision and support each other in, in the roles, right? So in my mind, the board would be saying to the management, wow, um, have your eyes open. Be fresh thinking. We're open to change. You know, we're, but, but we've got our eye on, 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 the, on the big picture and the, and the outcome. You know, I think this thing that the stuff that Peg was describing uh, needs to be talked about so that it's it's it comes to life right and that because if you don't talk about that uh, like why we're here and the purpose thing that we were we were just reviewing then you might be sucked into oh here's the you know right now uh, we're in the first phase of the Harvard Business Review work and we're we're optimizing and we're how do they describe that stuff Walden we're we're we're, we're we're becoming most efficient, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We're getting rid of stuff that that that, uh, that you know we really that, that we need to get rid of, and if that becomes the focus, then we missed it. We, that has to happen to be tuned, but actually, it's being done so that we can drive the mission, mm -hmm. so that we can mm -hmm. we can we can get what we want. And so, if a program gets cut, uh, you know what? We weren't here for that program. <laughs> We, we've got a bigger thing going, and I think that uh, allows for um, a, you know nurtured relationship, um, especially in, in in management. I think instead of the board reacting that oh my gosh really, it's like okay we see here we see where you're coming from on that, and we really are looking for this this long this longer cycle. Let's let's be strong and take advantage of opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. So I think role clarity is big. And, and being supportive all the way through. What would you add to that, Martha? You just caught me off guard. Sorry, what would you add to that, Walden? <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. No, uh -oh, I, 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 would, I would go ditto. <laughs> yeah. I could add something yeah. to it, Mark. <laughs> no, Peg. So the only thing I wanted to add is just is that I think uh, I heard a, this guy from Parliament. On, in the sicko movie, and he's talking about the two enemies of democracy are fear and sec or the tools for breaking down democracy are fear and uh, demoralizing the public. And so if you think about what the opposite would be, it would be addressing our fears in a way that's meaningful in the context of our co-ops and our members, and then doing the sorts of things that will do the opposite of demoralizing by creating the new world we want to live in or, you know, something realistic but uh, something we come to together. You know, so there's this idea that somehow we don't stuff our fears. We actually find a way to really move through them because that's what makes us strong. So I just wanted to add that to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, I, I would... <coughs> Uh, besides role clarity, it, it you know building on what we have been talking about for uh, this you know kind of building the foundation of governance of having expectations, right? So we're we're going to be clear, 
and now I think uh, part of this this uh, slide that we have up now, just like, do we see fresh thinking? You know, can we see that in fact um, uh, our management is aware of the stuff that we've been talking about, right? Because we're all, you know, besides alignment, we also want to have confidence, and we're also building on on that whole uh, trust issue. And because you know we're like on the train together, and I think one thing for the board is it's it's going to need to see that um, management isn't just thinking that we are in you know um, January of 2008, right? It's a special time, uh, new challenges and new opportunities. So that to me is the uh, another part of of the answer, Marilyn, in that uh, you know if we I, I describe it sometimes as a, a call and response system, right? And and uh, part of what we were uh, that we're, we're going to a little bit talk about tonight is just like, hey, where does this show up from management that um, that this freshness exists? Because I think that the board needs to feel and 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 kind of uh, not only feel but be able to demonstrate that. The organization um, is is on solid ground, and what the solid ground is based on is the um, is, is the talent of, of management. Really, that management is awake and is managing these new trends, and um, doing what Walden was describing in the Harvard Business Review article, and 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 hopefully, ideally, uh, getting to that stage also where we're able to seize the advantage. And I think if the board has a sense of that level of, of um, uh, preparedness or reflection or tuning, then it's easier for the board to do uh, that communication thing about driving the mission. Right? It happens in tandem, but it's, it's, it's much easier if the board has that sense of stability and doesn't come to the meeting going, you know, oh my god, well, what's, you know, how are we doing? Management really has a role of, of providing that in, uh, information and demonstration in a manner that really makes it clear, right? So that's another part of, of, the, of the story, I think. The tandem accountability, and uh, referring back to PEG and, and increasing the morale, if you are requiring your board to be accountable to each other and, and having that high level of process of how you're going to conduct yourself that filters down to the manager and your relationship with your manager. So that expectation is high amongst the board, and then it, it's very easy to shift that into high expectations of the manager, and the manager feels it. And I yeah. think it's, you know, and it's responsive to that. I think they want to be responsive. Everyone wants to, to reach high, and you're giving them that space um, that we're prepared for you. What do you got? Um, right. and I've seen that evolve over the past couple of years. Yeah, and and uh, to build on that, Mark, uh, there's a, a board that that I work with that uh, studied all last year really uh, uh, the idea of of regional cooperative movements around the world and the sort of economy, and um, and not only did they love doing it, <laughs> and they wrote it up. Uh, in their newsletter, and people came to their meetings and 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 thought that this was really good stuff. But it also had an effect on how uh, it, it created a larger context for management to think about its planning. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it it kind of expands the horizon uh, for management when the when the board is is really seriously assuming that leadership position. Um, so it's a little bit what you're saying, and just. Yes. And in their case, you know, they didn't. Uh, they, they're doing it also to direct on. Do they have the policies that they want? But they've been happy with their policies, and they're still driving this conversation. You know, they're they're um, talking the walk, you might say, right? Um, uh, Walden or Peg, any any follow up on on those comments? Well, I, I do have one. Um, uh, from the Harvard Business Review, and I'm not sure if it if it uh, 
fits into that, you know, to, to what we're really doing or not. But I, I like the two quotes that uh, Arthur's used. They, they said, often uh, in a downturn like this, when you're really getting back to your core business, um, they said a lot of times you could revive earlier efficiency initiatives too controversial to implement in better times. I don't know if that contradicts what you just said or supports what you just said. <laughs> that was an interesting quote, I thought. And I remember several of the managers at New Orleans picked up on that, and there was quite a little bit of buzz. Do you, you recall that, Peg and yep. Marilyn and Mark, that, yeah. that, yeah. that uh, discussion? And the other thing that I, I took that I thought might practically apply to to us uh, that they mentioned, I think it's along the lines you were promoting, Mark, was, is, is maybe discontinued long-standing but low-value added activities. I, I think it was kind of maybe your example of New Orleans starting fresh, that, that we have these sacred cows in there that, that we need to maybe thin the herd on. And I guess the, if we're thinning the herd of sacred cows, then making sure that we keep focused on our on our ultimate ends and, uh, yes. and don't sacrifice those. So That's right. I thought that was really practical, opportunistic advice. And um, given the context of the co-ops, you know, I think we have to be pretty careful with it. But but uh, as Peg said, you know, don't 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 waste that crisis. Yeah, right. And and it's a great time. Uh, it's on it's on one of one of our slides here. It's a great time to be. Um, to be outcome oriented, you know. So, if you know, as Peg as Peg um, summarized some some pretty common um, desired outcomes of you know driving the local economy and and improving the access for local and regionally produced food, or just facilitating building our own community, whatever that might be, having that thriving community marketplace. There are so many ways that that can develop. And, um, and and again, the idea of the board being open to change, being you know seeing that look we are in a dynamic uh, time. Let's let's not um, uh, the same old same old you know maybe isn't the best strategy. You know what's the fresh thinking? How does it show up? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's really good stuff. Um, I made some notes here on um, where a board might see the fresh thinking or the manager's response um, uh, to this kind of unique time. And just to kind of breeze through those, not to necessarily uh, go deeply into them, but in the um, manager's monthly, I, I like to call them FYI, no action needed reports. So this is the manager providing information upstream to the board about, hey, you know, here is our regional unemployment trend, or here is our new the new bar that we're trying to hit in relationship to price competition, um, or internal things like wow we're adjusting our planning cycle, or you know we got rid of the sacred cow <laughs> finally you know or you know oh sorry you know let's all bring tissue uh, to the meeting because it, it you know it's hard but um, those those types of of um, of pieces of information really help build a story. And it's, it's helpful if management can be aware of you know, what they might be, those things to pass upstream to the board so that the board has a sense of how things are evolving. It's a tricky job of getting the, the right level of detail. You know, it's like, please, not the, we don't want the deep detail. We just want those top level things that show that things are, that we are tracking. And, and uh, Martha, I don't know how does that um, does that come to you in a written report with every meeting, that type of stuff? Well, about a, a year ago, we got a switch from written reports to a lot of graphs on uh -huh. key asset protection items, or and especially now that we you know the cycle, the business cycle is shifting, um, and we start to see a little different maybe movement in some of these graphs. It it tells a story very quickly, right. and it promotes um, inquiry. Right. Uh, where do you think this is headed? And I, I really have appreciated that change in presentation. Yep. And then, you know, I think, too, what I see a lot of is a little bit, you know, the, the two or three sentence narrative 
on uh, on four items that that were you know significant internal change, and mm -hmm. that's the type of thing that I'm thinking when we're seeing fresh thinking going on. Uh, like you know, again, back to the Harvard Business Review article of of you know tuning or or efficiencies. Just I'd mention every now and then of you know something significant that that they uncovered. Uh, you know, really also helps harder harder to do some of that in in graph form. But I yeah, I think graphs and tables are are awesome too. And uh, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask if um you know if that monthly sales graph that Marilyn went over uh, might be good along the lines that you and Martha were just talking about, or if that's too detailed for a board. And I also wanted to ask Peg that question, because Peg, I think that was uh, collecting that monthly information was originally your idea. That's my recollection of how it got started anyway, and what, what, whether or not you saw that as a purpose of it too. The uh, I think actually Ben Ben talked about it first, or we all, we talked about it together, and he initiated it. But in any case, mm -hmm. the um, the idea that somehow uh, what it does is it helps describe a common cause. And so what I was seeing when I was looking at this is, you know, the FYI report um, is an important tool that the board has for staying knowledgeable, not just about your community and what's going on there, but about what's happening to everybody on an industry level and how it's affecting our store. So it seems like right now it's more important than it ever has been. Yeah. And that the, that the danger is to try is that if you, if you get too detailed, that you get snared and are not able to, to right. lead forward. But if you don't get the information you need, how are you going to be able to tell you know, when things are not going as well as you think they should, or you might want to pick up on getting additional reports or whatever. So I think there's those lines that everybody's trying to understand where they are and where where to cut them in order to free everybody to work in the ways that they're going to be most effective, to free the board to, to, to provide leadership and to, to sort of stabilize, decrease fear, increase interdependence and understanding of it, and to really free the manager to activate all the tools and resources they need in order to be able to run an efficient business. So right. it's, it's, it's a, there's lines in there. So the monthly sales report might help if someone's trying to help someone understand it's not just me, it's not just our co-op. This is really happening on a, on a bigger scale. And in fact, these bigger scale pieces of information are increasingly helpful in helping me paint the picture for myself. Martha. You and you talk about the graphs. Is that what you're seeing? Is I mean, do you feel like they're deep? Well, our graphs are are internal, so they're just about us. Though so we get uh, an annual report on employment in the state and our wage compared to the averages in the state, so we have a sense of that. But what comes up having us thinking about our discussion hour and coming up with things to read about? We now share news paper articles a lot via email. Or, I mean, people are just, uh, oh, did you see this one? And that's all right. about trends. And that right. ha that's, has risen significantly. So, and some of that is going to make it into a study session, but some of it is just an FYI. Right. So and what you're describing is that people are alive, right? And they get right. that, hey, this is actually important. <laughs> and mm -hmm. let's, let's work together and learn together and be tuned in. Right, mm -hmm. and um, to me, Peg, the way I the way I picture um, this this uh, what you're describing uh, around the FYI level information, and really these other these other policy based management responses, is that we're looking for the foundation that the board can stand on, so it can with confidence go out and actually do this other leadership thing. So the snare uh, is real because we could get the FYI report and spend all of our valued time actually talking about the sales trend. And in my mind, you'd get the FYI report so that you're informed about the sales trend, and then you'd be having the conversation about driving the mission. <laughs> right? What is this? Uh, how, how are we benefiting community? 
how, what is our role in, in, in building the local economy? Or what is our connection with uh, the thriving uh, food system in our region? That, that type of stuff. And yet, it only happens, really, if you have a solid foundation based on information coming up stream from management. So here's just a couple other examples. You know, typically, you'd have a financial conditions policy and a planning and budgeting policy. And it's very likely that management is rethinking uh, benchmarks, providing uh, you know, very important information in there. It's, 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 a, it's for a different purpose. It is about uh, providing accountability, uh, not just FYI stuff. Uh, we include here under planning and budgeting, this is a great time for boards to see that, that being in the budget approval business might be a bad idea because the planning cycle is accelerated. Right? So the old days of having an annual budget is, is, is I don't know, <laughs> um, less valuable. And the idea that in your planning and budgeting policy, you could have very, very very important criteria for planning, and that that, in fact, is going to uh, guide and control management, even if they're doing planning and budgeting on a weekly, monthly, and quarterly basis. So if you're, if you're still in the budget approval business, this is a good time to uh, make a, uh, a meaningful shift. Uh, but for management, you might be looking for, uh, uh, in, in their report back on planning and budgeting, gee, have we shifted our cycle of planning, you know? Um, we used to do it annually, now we're doing it quarterly. Maybe we're, you know, churning some stuff even a higher frequency to make sure that that um, things are okay. Here's just, you know, a couple of other examples of where I think it's going to be showing up, uh, making sure that the assets are protected. And, uh, and I think that these uh, two points kind of strike the balance between not unreasonably risking and yet also making sure that we're poised for opportunities. And then, you know, whatever happens, just make sure that we've uh, got systems in place for the appropriate treatment of staff because uh, we know from our history that that's, you know, incredibly important to everyone in our organization. So I would expect to see that kind of stuff. Um, here is a fundamental principle of being reasonable. Thane Joyal wrote this up in Co-op Grocer a couple of months ago. Um, a very important idea, especially now when there might be more things changing. I would sum it up by just look for a rationale. If you've got management initiative taking place and there's, and there, there, uh, there's change happening, um, when you're being a good judge, just look for uh, good, solid rationale, sound reasoning, and I like to, I use this phrase, third-party support, but what I really mean by that is um, uh, can a person support the approach being taken? Is it supportable? Um, and using the reasonableness as the threshold test. And I think this is just a, an important time to be refreshing on that so that you don't have the individual directors um, trying to decide if they like what's going on, you know, based on their own personal, um, their own personal criteria. So keep, keep testing for reasonableness. And these last two ideas, I think if, if, you, want it, if you want to ask the question, is our board adding value? It's a great question. How do we add value? Um, and how do we work to create and sustain a cooperative development culture? Are we thinking about the future? Who could we invite in the conversation? How do we tell the story along the way? To me, these are really key issues for, um, for building in the we cycle. So good luck with that. I'll open up a little space here, Marilyn. Thanks, Mark. Uh, you want to shift here to the last slide and just a, a summary of, of what we hope we communicated here tonight coming up in the, in the last five minutes of our, our webinar. I'll look through this and then ask each of our, our guests to provide a, a little summary of their own. Uh, the, the economy is having an impact on our business. It's true. We know that, that, that co-op managers do need to respond. Um, and and they also probably need to modify the information that they are 
providing to our boards, and this is a great time to to be supporting managers in, in doing that. We do have a lot of managers on the call tonight with us, and we sure appreciate you being here. There are some webinars that the NCGA has sponsored specifically on the topic of developing uh, reports for your boards, and we'd be happy to help you get access to those if you don't have them already. Um, and then just the new opportunities that exist in this we cycle, in this new era that we think uh, we're coming into of people understanding the value of cooperation, understanding the value of local and community ownership, and getting clear and better at communicating why we, we do the work that we do, why we support the, the cooperative model, why we think it's a, a better solution, especially now, especially in these times, why it's good for communities. That for boards, um, keep governing, and there's a lot to governing, and so uh, keep focusing on that and keep working on getting better at governing at high levels. Um, as we wrap up tonight's session, I want to go back around and give each of our uh, uh, panelists a, a chance to summarize what, what they thought was important out of tonight's session. And uh, Walden, could we start with you and then Peg and Martha and Mark? Well, I, I, I'd sum up by saying I think it's a perfect storm for co-ops, uh, the recession, and this, uh, the, the we generation coming back in. And uh, shame on us if we don't take advantage of it and, and uh, create more co-ops, more great co-ops out of it. Thank you. Peg? Well, I'd sum up by saying nothing will uh, help your co-op as a business more than if the uh, board is very strong in providing leadership for the board and also for the membership and in catalyzing the membership's interest in the co-op and in its, um, its role as owners and that the board uh, in that way really supports management best. Thank you. And Martha? What I got out of it was when Walden is suggesting a five-year win window, we don't know exactly, but there's a window. And we don't, aren't going to know exactly what to do tomorrow to take uh, advantage of a known opportunity or an unknown opportunity. But that's sort of a co-op advantage. We, are, we go slowly. We're not Whole Foods. When you looked at that chart when it went straight up in the 90s, um, we do move slower. And if we allow ourselves to realize um, that we get to put focus on our process and our values and who we are and reach for a high expectation that we're in it for the long haul. And so, yeah, we do need to get better at governing, but we, and we can, and know that even if it takes us two years to figure out how to get a better capitalization program in, there's still time for that window. So let's do that program right. Let's take the time to really think this through. Thank you. And Mark? I think it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> I, and, and, <laughs> I really do. And I think that we know a lot about how to do it and that we shouldn't settle for anything less. Mm -hmm. So let's do it and let's have fun with it. Oh, yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Well, it's been really great to have all of you with us tonight. Uh, we There's certainly more to this conversation, and we hope that all of you in your boards uh, and in your boardrooms will continue to have the conversation and share with us the results of, of what you're learning and thinking about. Uh, try stuff out. Have fun with it. And let us know. Let other co-ops know uh, what you've tried, what's successful, what's working, and, uh, and have a, another a circle of we here amongst the, the leaders of the food co-op system today. So thanks for coming. Uh, there, the evaluation will be popping up shortly, and the recording will be available within 48 hours. That's the, true. The next, uh, the next webinar is um, uh, April 15th. Up. Good, thanks. Say that again, Mark. April 15th. And the topic? Uh, hey, yeah. that one you lost me on. <laughs> But I was going to promote uh, going to the Seabuild Library 
uh, tons of stuff there, especially if we need to deal with fundamentals and actually doing the stuff that we need to stand on in order to do this, this good work. And there's a C-Build News link right there, and that has a schedule for all the upcoming webinars. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Martha. Thanks, Peg. Thanks, Walden. Thank you, Mark. Sure. Thank all of you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Right. Bye. Bye.